Thank you. So thank you all for joining us today for strategies for surviving the thesis and dissertation process. Today we have um, various PhD and master's graduates joining us. They will be answering your questions about how to survive your thesis and dissertation process. So I'm gonna hand it over to them so they can um, introduce themselves. And after that portion, we'll begin taking questions. So Jeff, would you please start us off? Absolutely, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Jeff Eggleston. Um, I graduated from UNLV in 2018 uh, with a PhD in interdisciplinary health sciences. Um, I am currently an assistant professor um, in the Department of Kinesiology at the University of Texas El Paso. Um, also the lab director for the Stanley E. Fulton Gate Research and Movement Analysis Laboratory. Is there anything else you want me to say? Yeah. Is that good? Okay. Good. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Would I go next? Yes, please. Pass. Hi, everybody. So I'm Valerie no, Burke. Let me sit with you. And of course, I have my four-year-old here who wants to sit with me. So um, let's see. A lot of you might know me as the assistant dean of the graduate college, but um, I did get my PhD in sociology from UNLV. I graduated um, May of 19. And um, i had been working throughout um, my entire uh, PhD career, so I can definitely show a little twist on how um, to incorporate getting everything done while working full time. And um, so I worked in the grad college, and now um, with that with the PhD. Um, actually opened up even more doors for me, obviously, to get a promotion to assistant dean. Um, and uh, working on a lot more research, um, grant writing, publications, and things like that. So I'm glad to be here with you guys. Thank you, Val. And we'll just go down to the next square over. Uh, Justin? Everybody hear me okay? Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Justin Lewis. I graduated in uh, winter of 2014 with a master's in applied economics. And I'm currently um, a data analytics manager at Dish Network um, at their office in Denver. Cool. And last but not least, Yulia. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Yulia, and I graduated from UNLV with a PhD in clinical psychology. So I'm a clinical psychologist by training, currently working on my licensure. Um, I just finished my postdoc year, um, so that means I graduated last summer, um, and uh, I just transitioned to a faculty appointment at the Medical University of South Carolina. Congratulations. So we did have a couple of students email in questions ahead of time while we wait for maybe um, just conversation to take its natural course, and if any questions do pop up, we'll be looking at those in the chat. So. Um, I know I can personally relate with um, a lot of our boot campers who are joining us today um, in the process of just, or rather the struggle to get the process started, right? I'm working on my proposal right now, and I had a large gap in between passing comps and, you know, restarting up that engine. So if any of you can share, um, what did you actually struggle with the most and how did you overcome um, that struggle? whether that was while you were writing your thesis or dissertation. Uh, I guess I can go first. Um, you know, I didn't write a traditional dissertation. Um, I wrote a multi-study dissertation. Um, but the, the challenge for me was trying to wrap all of those studies into a single discussion. Um, into a single kind of, what does this all mean? And I was lucky enough, at first I didn't really have motivation, and then I was hired into my current position, and I, then I knew that I had to finish. Um, so that kind of provided me the, the motivation. But it was really, you know, trying to connect all of those dots. And my studies were, were related, but, um, you know, I had to really think, um, I guess, more critically about how to connect it all so that everyone can really understand Kind of the breadth and the importance of what I was trying to do. Uh, 
That's really interesting that you bring that up, Jeff, because earlier this week, I don't know if anyone joined us for um, how to get our thesis and our dissertation published workshop. And they talked a lot about the three article dissertation, the biggest challenge being connecting the dots between um, your three studies. So that's interesting that like now we're almost connecting the dots between two different workshops, right? That that was something that you struggled with. And that was a piece of advice um, that I really took away from that talk, right? And that was that before you even get started, make sure you have that connection between all studies. Did anybody um, of any other of our panelists, did anyone do a more traditional dissertation or the classic dissertation? Yeah, Which I did. Um, I, so in clinical psychology, we, it's a doctorate program, but we still get a master's on the way. Like I'm sure some other programs do as well. So somewhere between year two and three, I defended my thesis um, and actually ended up publishing it, um, actually having two publications um, for my thesis, which was pretty cool. Um, and then my dissertation pretty much started on my dissertation right away. And I decided to, instead of doing the three paper dissertation, I decided to uh, get the experience of running a randomized control trial myself, just because I had fantastic mentorship and I, um, you know, firsthand experience and was the coordinator of a major NIDA funded study that was a, an RCT. So I wanted to just have my miniature <laughs> RCT as well, um, just so I can say, you know, I did it myself from scratch. Um, and that was certainly an investment of time and effort and energy, um, but I was able to uh, complete the data collection within several months, um, probably within the spring semester even. Um, and then defended it in September. So spend the summer kind of analyzing the data. Um, that was very ambitious. And I was very lucky to have the research assistance that I had and actually the support from the RAMP program because I had um, some mentees that helped me in the process while I was helping them um, with their goals. So it really worked out nicely. So um, if we're talking about advice for other students that are going through this process right now, I would definitely recommend relying on research assistance, relying on programs such as RAMP that can give you that assistance and that support and financial funding if, if um, you need it. So definitely look around for options because they're there. Thanks, Celia. Justin, were there any um, particular things that you remember or recall that you struggled with during the thesis, um, you're writing your thesis? Yeah, so one of the things that was kind of a fun challenge, but also was stressful at times was, you know, trying to figure out if the data source that I had come up with to to investigate was actually going to be able to bear any fruit or not, or if it was just going to be, you know, something that really didn't provide any insight. And then I would be, you know, two thirds of the way through the summer and, oh, there's really nothing there's really not much of a conclusion here or it's it's kind of just noisy. <laughs> so I was always like, okay, I really hope there's something here. Um, so the challenging piece was taking data that was really like qualitative for the most part. It was a lot like a, a big series of like short written reports of like um, incidences. Basically, I was looking at instances of um, piracy or armed robbery out on the ocean. And there'd be these reports that would, you know, describe what happened and then it would be like, okay, how do I read those reports and classify, you know, characteristics of them in some kind of like consistent systematic way so that I can turn those into data points. And it ended up, you know, being a lot of, you know, zeros and ones and twos, or it means this if this happened and et cetera, et cetera. But, and I, I kind of had to figure that out as I went along where I was like, what's actually in all of these and what are the different, you know, characteristics of what I'm looking at. So uh, that was definitely a challenge, um, but, it, but it was also a lot of fun. Um, I definitely, as far as like, um, Yulio, you mentioned like some of the resources and taking advantage of those. One of the best things that I did was um, uh, got some funding to go to a conference uh, during the summer where I was writing the thesis. 
like kind of towards the end of it where I had sort of like a, a draft of it and being able to go and get, you know, specific feedback from people in that like specific subdiscipline that I was doing research in was, you know, super valuable and, and UNLV was incredibly helpful with, you know, helping make that possible. It was, it definitely helped me to um, minimize the number of surprises that I would have when I, you know, started diving deep into it with my, you know, advisors and my reviewers as we got further down the line. Yeah, I think a lot of us can um, relate to being nervous about not having substantial findings, right? That's, um, and that's right when we're in the middle of our thesis or dissertation, right? So thanks for being honest and transparent about that, Justin. Um, Dr. John Luepo now joined us. Um, we did introductions a little bit earlier, but we're happy to have you now. Could you um, introduce yourself, John? We're glad to have you. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Hi, my name is John. Um, it's good to be here. Sorry, I'm late. I, I'm i still adapting. I moved to the East Coast, so um, the time difference stuff, I'm still getting confused. So pardon my lateness, um, but it's good to be here. Thank you so much. And um, if you can share with everyone your uh, area of discipline, Okay, yeah, so um, I finished my PhD in public health from UNLV. Yeah, so I did um, with a concentration in global health and environmental health. Great, so we do have a couple of questions coming in. Yulia, um, one of our students asked, can you expand on your RAMP experience and exactly what is RAMP? RAMP is the rebel mentor, let's see. Valerie, <laughs> I'm being tested. Rebel <laughs> Research and Mentorship Program. Yes, there you go. Um, so it's a program, uh, I believe the inaugural year was 2017, um, which is when I first joined. Um, and then I applied for it again the following year. So I was part of it um, for two years and ended up mentoring a couple of different students throughout. Um, this is the program that's available through the Graduate College, and Valerie can speak more to it. I'm sure it's still going because it was a wonderful program, and it provided um, research support um, in the sense of having a dedicated research assistant uh, who is assigned to you, who you're mentoring. Typically, it's somebody either through your college or through your department, or in my case, it was somebody from my research lab. Um, somebody who I would be working with anyway, but that allowed me to focus on kind of more one-on-one -on -one mentorship with them. And while I was mentoring them uh, on how to, um, you know, learn to do research, how publications work, how um, data analysis, like all those tasks that they might need as a graduate student, I was also mentoring them on putting together their CV putting to a resume, depending what their goals were, um, helping them choose graduate programs, helping them with the application process to get into graduate school. Um, and I'm happy to say that both of my mentees got into graduate school at, at UNLV, so um, that was really cool. But they helped me push my dissertation forward, um, you know, having that manpower. And um, you get the experience as a mentor and you sharpen your administrative skills, your uh, mentorship skills, while uh, they get the experience they need to get to where they want. Yeah, ramps really interesting right now that we're talking about motivation and like struggling to like whether that's get started or or even translating and um, the analysis of our of our findings, right? Having that uh, student assistant to bounce ideas off or to help you collect data. And it's ramp, um, correct me if I'm mistaken, Val or Yulia, it's a year long program, right? So you have that graduate, or excuse me, that undergraduate assistant for a year, right? So that should really like motivate you to take advantage of having that support that year. Um, yeah, we have a, I add, um, forgot to mention that there's also um, 
or was at least, I don't know how it is now, but there was financial assistance to attend the conference and present research findings. So that really helped because I was able to go with my research assistant to the conference and get that expense covered. Yeah, that's really nice. Money is always motivating, right? Um, we have another question coming in. It says, Val, would, it would be great to know about your transition from graduate level to your current position with UNLV Grad College. What were the requirements for that position and how did you get into that position? I think it's really relevant. Also, you mentioned in your introduction, Val, that you were balancing writing your dissertation and working at the same time. Yeah, I'll just give you um, a quick background. So when I started um, at UNLV, I was an academic advisor. So um, if any of you, you know, gone through undergrad at UNLV or similar institutions that have academic advising centers, I was an academic advisor. Um, I started as an advisor as a GA, so as a graduate assistant, and I was in the school counseling program. So I thought I was going to be a high school guidance counselor. So as I'm going through that master's program, I was doing um, my GA at the advising center for liberal arts, and I loved I'm it. You knew that was going to happen, right? Yes, oh, it's it's right. And so with that, I said, you know what? Oh, my God, I love this. And I switched master's programs to higher ed so that I could keep moving up in um, higher ed um, administration. And so I um, got my master's in higher ed. Um, I became a full-time advisor after the GA position. And then I kind of just kept moving up the chain that way. Um, I was working for the vice provost for academic affairs as the uh, first ever student academic integration coordinator. And I decided to start my PhD program. Um, and I started doing projects with the grad college and trying to, I was working on the undergrad side, get, trying to get grad students and undergrad students to start working together. I opened up our Nellis Air Force Base campus. And um, so from there, I learned more about the graduate education. And then I was also a PhD student. So when the executive director for graduate student services position um, was created, I applied for it. And I've been doing that for about five years. And then once I got my PhD, um, I was able to then be promoted to assistant dean. So that's where I'm at now. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about my dissertation process okay, because, yeah. yeah, so while I was um, working on my PhD program, I was working full time and um, I also started a business. Um, I started a family. I got married. <laughs> we have a four year old now. So I just want you to know that you can do it all if you want to. If you want to wait and do one thing at a time, that's awesome too. If you're like, I want to do everything at once, just like Val did it, I can totally do it. Um, I think the goal for me was setting those short-term and long-term goals of what I wanted out of life. Um, so in addition to my PhD program and then my you know bigger life outside of school, and then having a really good support system obviously really helps too. Um, and then I'd say the biggest obstacles I hit along my dissertation writing, I don't know, raise your hand if you were told that don't think of your dissertation or your thesis as your like end all be all project for your entire life. Like it's gotta be the best thing you've ever written ever, right? And they say, don't even worry about doing mixed methods, you know, just pick quantitative or qualitative. So I'm like, all right, this is totally what I'm gonna go for, right? I do my proposal and they're like, oh my God, my committee's like, this is so good. You really need to do mixed methods. Awesome, because guess what mixed methods means? <laughs> you have more work, you have more I RIB to go through. Um, you have, I did focus groups, I had to do a Qualtrics survey, I had to analyze all that data, and did it make it that much better? And did it really build my skills in both um, quantitative and qualitative um, skills? Yeah, totally did. Transferable skills and made me a better person, but was it a lot more work along the way? Who can agree with me? <laughs> Shake your head, yes. <laughs> John's with me. Jeff, yeah, Julia. Um, so if you guys have any questions about that, definitely let me know, but that's pretty much my life in a nutshell. Thanks. Thanks. Val. I mean, I think that's a great example of like life is still happening, even though you're enrolled in a PhD or in a master's program, right? Like the rest of your life outside of the classroom or outside of academia doesn't stop just because you're in a PhD program. So balancing and um, prioritizing what you can and can't handle or what you do and don't want um life is just going to keep happening um so john if you could start us off with this next question that came in um because you didn't get a chance to share with us inside of the first couple of questions um looking back on the writing process and knowing what you know now what would you have done differently and after john anyone else that would like to chime in of our panelists please do uh so 
for me, uh, how do I describe? I came into the process open-eyed, right? And as a mature student, like Val explained, I had two children before I came into grad school. My children were four and two. So I came here with my family. I knew um, it was, I wanted to face the project squarely. So I was a full-time student for three years. No other distraction. I just focused and got, got stuff, the stuff I wanted to do. I got it done. Uh, the writing process, I, I came into it with a project management mindset. So I already knew what I wanted to do. But like Val said, something that happened along the way, I did a mixed method too. So what I did was to make sure I had enough time, right? I actually dedicated like a whole semester. I collected all my data, right? And a whole year I dedicated to writing. That was what I did, right? Most people dedicated once dedicate one semester to writing. I dedicated a whole year to writing. So practically my final year, I had collect by the summer of my second year, I had collected all my data, right? So my last year, my third year, I was just writing. So it was more about what do I want to achieve today? How many pages can I write today? Um, people say, even if you write 15 minutes a day, it's fine. But sometimes I never wrote 15 minutes. Sometimes I will write two hours in one day. Some days I will not be able to write anything, right? Like you said, life goes on. So, but what, what I made sure was I, I had worked with my advisor earlier on and I had given my advisor, one of, one of the things I did was to make myself very accountable to my advisor, right? I told her this was when I want to graduate. So we walked back from when I wanted to graduate and I uh, told her, this is when I wanted to do my dissertation defense. I did my dissertation defense in March. This is when I wanted to do my dissertation defense. So she had told me, okay, if you want to do your dissertation defense on this date, you need to get me the first draft of your dissertation by say before January end, right? So all over the um, holiday break, I was writing, but it took a lot of work. Um, what would I have done differently? Maybe I would have given myself a lot more time, maybe. So one thing I realized is no matter how much you think, how much time you think you need, just double that time because there will always be something, especially if you don't carry your advice along very well along the way. You don't want to finish writing a 135 page document and send it in and they say, oh no, go and rewrite this whole section of 10 pages. You know, you don't want to do that. So I was lucky. I carried my advice along and things went smoothly when I gave her the first draft. She made only very few corrections and I was ready to go. I can jump in here because I actually took some notes. Um, unless somebody else wants to chime in, I don't want to monopolize. Good, okay. So, um, my thesis, I would say, is was the first project from which I learned what I wanted to do different from my dissertation. So my dissertation process, I wouldn't have done anything different because I already learned from my mistakes during my thesis. So the mistakes, I would say, were stretching it out for too long and overthinking it. I picked a topic that was way too ambitious, I think, for a thesis. Because like I said earlier, I published two manuscripts from it. It was a thesis. Most theses don't even get published. So for your thesis, don't overthink it. Pick something easy, something you can knock out in a year. My thesis took me about two and a half years, I want to say, from start to finish. Um, my dissertation only took me about a year, maybe a year and a half. Um, which should be reversed. <laughs> um, the problems were finding the time because I was managing my advisors. Um, I was in a coordinator position in, in my research lab. So there was always something that trumped my personal research. But you have to find a way to prioritize. You have to find a way to schedule regular meetings with your advisor that focus only on your work, not 
lab goals, lab meetings, but your personal time, your mentorship. And that will help. Um, some other tips that I can recommend um, is if you have senior um, graduate students in your lab or in your program, ask them for their templates. Uh, I've done it with my students um, in my program when I defended my dissertation. Um, one of the professors who was on my committee reached out to me and said, is that okay if I use your dissertation um, because he really enjoyed it um, and said it was well done. He asked, can I use it as a model for my students in my lab? And I was happy, of course, to share. And I would share it with more people if I could. Um, so definitely ask around and get a model, get a template. So you don't have to reinvent the bicycle because it's already been created. You don't need to overthink this process. Um, and graduate college has some templates as well, but I found asking within my lab and within my program to be a better strategy, just because different departments, different mentors have a different style of how they want you to write your dissertation or your thesis. Um, set deadlines, that's another one. With my thesis, I kind of procrastinated a lot. Um, there was a lot of fluff in my writing. I just didn't know which direction to go. Um, but as soon as you set some deadlines, like you have to finish it by this date because you have your proposal scheduled on that date, you're gonna, you're gonna work much harder. So set some deadlines, they can be phantom deadlines, they can be actual deadlines, but that seems to work because you will be more motivated. Um, also, take care of yourself. That cannot be emphasized enough because we forget to take care of our, our own well-being and mental health because we're working so hard and we have goals and ambitions. So take the time to take care of yourself and sleep, do something nice for yourself, take a day off, connect with people outside of your program, have a life outside of your program, something that will help you to prevent burnout. Also kind of going along with that, Learn to say no. So how many people can relate with that one where you just take on everything and then you're drowning? So learn to say no to some of the things. Prioritize what's important to you, what's going to help you in your career or your studies. And other things, just say, no, I can't do this. I only have so much time and it's okay. But that one I only learned when I got to my residency, um, which I did at Brown Medical School. That's when I said no. <laughs> I felt like I was in a position to say no, finally. Um, also avoid comparisons. Other students will be, there will be students that will be ahead of you. Um, they might be the same year in your program, but they will be far ahead in their dissertations and thesis. And it's not fair to compare because they might have a different advisor style, they might have different responsibilities, they might have less on their plate, they might have the same amount on their plate, but maybe they're just anxious and want to get everything done and you're more chill and you procrastinate. It Just don't compare it because that's just gonna cause more stress and, and panic. Um, one of my committee members told me something one time that really stuck with me and I'm gonna give you this quote. Um, this is from Dr. Freeman, Andrew Freeman. So shout out to Andrew. Um, he said, a good dissertation is a done dissertation. <laughs> so just, just do it, get it done. Um, I could have made my dissertation a lot more complicated and I wanted to, but then when he said that, I was like, this is just a building block towards bigger, more important things. Just get it done. So I know John touched on this a little bit um, and you, didn't have personal experience with this specific question, but um, one student asked, what are some suggestions uh, you have for dealing with um, a lot of feedback after your first draft, perhaps, um, especially when it feels overwhelming? Uh, so for me, like I said, I, 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 I think I'm one of the lucky few uh, I had an um, outstanding advisor right my advisor was dr jennifer far 
And from the get go, she guided me and she let me pick my topic. I picked something I really wanted to do. I wasn't doing something she wanted me to do, right? Now, because of that, I was able to structure my dissertation, the direction I wanted it to go. I got my data myself. I didn't use her data, right? I got all my data, both the quantitative, the qualitative. I got it myself from Nigeria, right? I didn't use any of her data. I didn't use... Um, so it was easy for me to structure my dissertation. And because she was very supportive, um, I was able to follow my own timelines. But because we had agreed on those timelines, it was easy to do all the to do. And um, one other thing that really helped me, I must confess, is um, in my third year, my final year, I got the President's UNLV Fellowship. Now, what that did for me was I didn't have to worry about 20 hours of GA time. So I was able to use all my time and focus on my own work. And what that helped me to do was I was even able to teach part-time as a part-time instructor in my um, in the School of Public Health. And that was 10 hours. So somehow, I, I think it just worked out for me um, uh, in a very good direction in terms of structuring what I wanted to do at what time and having a very supportive advisor. Uh, do you mind if I answer all the other questions directed to me on this chat? So just a particular question was was uh, directed just to everyone. How did we? How did any of you deal with um, feedback, um, even when it was especially overwhelming at times? I just mentioned that you had touched upon that your yeah. after yeah. your first draft, you didn't really um, have a lot yeah. of feedback, a lot of changes. Yeah, so, that so, so I, I think the major reason why is because I had an advisor and we worked. Step by step, we followed each step and worked closely together. So that was why I didn't have too many feedbacks. Did anybody else, like, kind of on the of the panelists, uh, struggle or felt like defeated after your first draft with too many um, suggestions or edits? Um, so I think that you know, going along with what John said, um, as long as your mentorship is good. Um, it really kind of eases that burden. Um, as a faculty member now, um, I have three PhD students and a handful of master's students. And the big thing that I tell them is that, you know, it's not personal because I feel like there are some times that we might have that emotional attachment to the baby that we've now put up to sacrifice, essentially. Um, but that the edits and all of that, it's, it's not a personal um, attack on what you've done or what you've written or your writing is bad. Um, it's just, you know, we want to help you learn and we want to help you grow. Um, and with most of my students, I tell them, you know, you can look at the comments, you can look at the revisions, but take a few days, leave it in the email, and then come back and let's talk about it. Um, because I know that some of my students have been fairly overwhelmed with it. Um, I don't particularly care. I know that my writing was uh, one of my weaker spots in terms of my skills, and I knew that was going to be the struggle for me. Um, so I knew that that was coming. Um, I knew that I was going to be standing and, in, in, you know, taking all of this criticism, and I, and I was fine with that. Um, but for others who maybe may not be used to it, you know, it's it's just that's part of the of growth, uh, of learning to be a scientist is learning how to communicate what it is that we do. And for some of us, that was harder. For others, um, you know, it, it comes up a little bit more naturally. But it's again, it's just part of growing and learning. Thanks, Jeff. Um, some students are asking if you all can share specifically um, what your dissertation or thesis topics were. Um, and I'll add on to that one from a previous question as well. Any resources um, that you kind of want to highlight that were really helpful as well? So if everyone can answer this question, actually, please. Okay, um, your topic and resources. Jessica, is that OK if I um, just comment on the one before? Uh, yes, please. A lot of feedback is better than not enough feedback. So you're lucky. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, one of the resources that helped me was the writing groups. Uh, my department 
um, and actually the graduate college did host some workshops for the writing, um, writing workshops, writing boot camps. Um, we had regular meetings where we met with um, smaller groups and provided each other feedback and it was very targeted. You would only potentially get like 15, 20 minutes of revisions and feedback. So your team might only get through like two or three pages of your writing, but the feedback is very targeted based on what you ask them to do or to look for. And the, um, I blanking on the name, the graduate, um, was it the graduate college or the, the writing lab or what do they call it, right? Writing center? Um, is it called the writing center? Yes, the writing center. I don't remember now. Yeah, I, I took advantage of that too. Um, I met with the, um, at that point, the director of the writing center and um, worked on my dissertation um, for several weeks, like hand by hand with her because English is my second language. And that was very important to me to get it right. And that was very helpful. Jeff, will you share your uh, dissertation topic and any resources um, that were super helpful? Yeah, so um, my topic was based um, on motor function and motor abilities in children with autism um, and looking at sort of the, the responses to um, external perturbations and how that might um, modify or alter their ability to move. Um, and as for resources, um, you know, it's kind of an external one, but I would always go to the professor is Uh, she was absolutely amazing. Um, and you know, it's just there, she has a ton of resources on that website, um, that really kind of helped me to, um, kind of prioritize what I needed to do. Um, I will be very honest. I procrastinate like no other. Um, I'm very good at it, but it is not the best skill to have, um, and in that, you know, my, my prioritization and my time management skills needed to be refined pretty well. Um, much like Val and John, um, I had two kids as well, and I was teaching, um, you know, I, I was in the lab 40 hours a week. And um, so doing all of those things, you know, having, having the resources to help me to understand what it was. And then as you get to, you know, your last year of your PhD and you're applying to faculty positions, that's a full-time job all on its own. Um, I applied to, I believe, 30 different positions, somewhere around 30. Um, and that, I mean, that's a whole nother animal. Um, but I mean, you know, doing all of those things. And really, I was relying on my friends who'd made it because I knew that I could. Um, right? I didn't feel like I had many special skills, but I was like, if they made it, I can make it. If anything else, I'll just be tenacious and I'll just do the thing and we'll be done. And then we'll sleep later. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's kind of how, how I worked the whole process. Justin, will you share with us your, um, thesis topic and any resources that you recall were super beneficial? Yeah, of course. Um, so my master's thesis was looking at, um, incidences of piracy or armed robbery, um, for maritime vessels of different spots across the globe and doing an evaluation to see if any circumstances of those events shaped the outcomes in a statistically meaningful way, specifically um, if what the, the crews of these vessels did, you know, could help shape the outcomes uh, predictably, even when you account for, you know, different factors and um, and things of that nature. Um, and so as far as resources went, um, I spent just a ton of time in the, um, the computing center at the lead library. It was like up on the second floor. Um, I had every type of like, you know, like software package I could imagine. And, you know, I could kind of just over the summer would just post up in there like all day and, and work through things. It was um, it was great to be able to have access to that rather than having to go you know, try and buy any of that myself or or use a, a tiny little screen and my kitchen table. Um, and then um, one of the websites that I liked quite a bit for uh, statistical type of stuff was um, UCLA had a great repository of like all these different types of 
statistical models and how they're related and how they work and what the pitfalls are and and just remember going through those like with a fine tooth comb to make sure like okay I want to be doing this is this lining up is my code giving me you know kind of what it should be uh, that sort of thing so that that was a great resource I think I mentioned this earlier but my department was great um, when I expressed interest in getting some feedback from um, like a specific community that worked a lot in that area, they just, you know, jumped on it and basically, you know, funded uh, the conference without me even having to ask about it. Um, all, I, all I really did was have to bring it up and they were super supportive. Um, and that was really great. Um, I think those were, those are probably my primary you know, places where I, I fell back on and, and, you know, used really regularly. That and finding a good place to work. Like the, the computing center was great because uh, had a nice kitchen, had a great view of uh, uh, Western Las Vegas and the mountain ranges. That was great. And then um, when I had to do some stuff that was a little bit more just like writing based and not computing, I'd go to this coffee shop in Summerlin, Samba Latte, I think it was called. It was super, uh, had a great vibe and could just kind of like you know, be at peace, sort of like the taking care of yourself that Julia was mentioning. Val, will you show your um, topic with us? Any resources as well? All right. So when I first started my program, I was doing it on reality TV because I love reality TV. I love studying it. Um, I wanted to see how like family dynamic was portrayed and things like that. Um, and then I took a class on social media and I actually had not been on social media. I had not been on Facebook or anything like that. Absolutely love the class. Completely changed my dissertation topic and started studying social media and my topic ended up being um, email is not dead um, and it focused on how to communicate with graduate college students so I mean obviously it resonated with my career the job I was in and it was something I wanted to read all the literature on right so it was a total win-win for me because I got to read all the literature that was good for my job and for my dissertation and now I get to do presentations on my dissertation not only in the sociology field but also at the conferences I go to for work like the councils of graduate schools, um, the Western Association of Graduate Schools, because they're all interested too. And in how do we best communicate with graduate students? Um, and I'd say my number one best resource while um, I was going through my program was definitely my committee. They were super responsive. Um, and if they weren't, I knew exactly where to find them. And they knew I was going to find them. And I knew their office hours. I knew their emails. I knew the hours that they liked to work. And I was pretty cognizant to make sure that um, I emailed and, and came to visit them when I knew it was a good time for them too. So was, and then that made us everyone comfortable and wanting to work together at the same time with a clear mind, ready to just focus on Val's dissertation. Um, so I do have fond memories of all that too. So that's it. Finally, John, I know you shared with us in the um, in the chat group, but also if you want to mention any resources that really um, stood out to you. So um, I think. Uh, my the major resources were my committee um so what I said is because i was doing a mixed method study jeff said he said writing was not his strong skill for me it was statistics i have never liked it till now i still don't like it right so when i was forming my committee i was very strategic i made sure i had a biostatistician on my committee right so to help me with the quantitative piece i made sure i had a qualitative researcher on my committee right and my advisor was now the mixed method person so because i had those three people i could easily go to any of them especially whenever i got statistically confused i could go to dr cross and he could help me walk through some of the models that i was trying to work uh to develop for my dissertation so my committee was my major resource, really. Okay. Now, this um, question here, it's in reference to something that Yulia, you mentioned. Um, and if we could just differentiate um, the difference between those PhD programs that have a stop at the master's level and then other programs that are only master's and then you have to find another program that's only PhD, because I believe there's a difference there. Um, so the question is, is there 
I just got another question that popped up, so it moved it. <laughs> is no, your thesis supposed to be a small con uh, a small contribution piece to your dissertation, or do they even have to be related? Yeah, I just answered that was me. Um, it does not have to be related, at least in my program. Um, it's considered as a separate project. You can make it related to make it easier for your dissertation. It could be like a pilot project for your dissertation, and then you can make a you know bigger study with some data. And if you apply for a grant, it's good to have pilot data as well. Um, but in my program, clinical psych PhD, it did not have to be related. Oh, cool. Well, the, thank you for answering that, Julia. It looks like um, Bianca's in the same program as you, so that's exciting um, and super helpful, right? Like the advice is uh, really applicable. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes. So to wrap up, I, I just kind of wanted to ask all of our panelists, is there anything that specifically that you would like to share um, with our boot campers? I think that one of the, I think it's been said before, um, I think it was Yulia mentioned it, you know, your dissertation or your thesis is not your career. Um, and the, it kind of goes back to, you know, is the thesis a part of your dissertation? The way that I think about it is your thesis is about putting tools in your toolbox, right? So it doesn't have to necessarily be related, but you need to be able to gain some skill. Um, and so for me, it was trying, how, how can I gain skill? What is it that I'm weak in? Um, what are what are my strengths? How can I capitalize on these things? Um, and that kind of that took some pretty deep reflection in terms of I thought I was good, I thought I was fantastic, but in reality I was just me, right? So I had to figure out what it was that I was good at, what I wasn't good at, and once I was able to do that, um, I think that really sort of helped me to um, figure out what I needed to do. Where where does what what needs my focus and how how do I make that happen? Um, once I got there, um, I felt like I was doing pretty well, um, and I think that that really it took a lot of pressure off uh, because I wasn't still searching. I wasn't always trying. I wasn't fighting. I was just I was just able to do, and that was really really helpful. Add to that. So there is something one of my mentors taught me very early when I started my PhD program. For those that are a bit more advanced in their PhD program, it may not be very helpful or in their master's program. But for those just starting, and one thing he taught me was for every class you take, right? Most of the professors we need you to do a term paper, right? To write something, you know. As much as is possible, try and make sure what you are writing for your 10 papers for your three or four classes each semester is related to that topic you are planning to use for your thesis or your dissertation. Now, if you can successfully do that over six courses, seven courses, eight courses, by the time you are getting to your dissertation or your thesis, I bet you, you would have done, you would have nearly finished all your literature review for that topic. Now, what that is, it places you ahead. You are like two steps ahead. When most people are getting to their dissertation and they want to do their proposal, they are just starting their literature review. But you would have nearly finished your literature review because you would have used all your readings and writings from all those courses you did in your first year, second year. You would have built on all that so that you understand the literature and you'll be able to hone in on where the gap is, which is what your research is supposed to focus on. So it's very helpful. For those that are just starting, if you can do that, your, it will be very easy when you get into your proposal um, let's step. I think too, if that's okay, share, um, share your a resource, um, not specific to writing your dissertation or thesis, but just getting through a PhD program or graduate program. Um, one of my lab mates, uh, Marina Galante, she started a blog and she kind of interviewed several of the um, former students that already graduated and collected 
feedback and advice, you know, how to survive your PhD. So I'm gonna send it to chat and you guys can browse it. And she has some really great advice on kind of how to cope, how to get through tough times, how to anything really through going through this program. So check it out. Really just wanted to give her a shout out. Um, I know she worked very hard on putting this together. Um, and I know there was a question earlier about the resource. Um, the great things that you guys already said, of course, um, I, I did all that, but also to add to um, these great things, find a statistician you can consult with um, if you are not fluent in stats. So I made sure that I had a statistician on my committee for both my thesis and my dissertation so I can consult with them on a regular basis. Um, and write a little bit every day. Um, I think John alluded to that. Um, just sit down, even if you don't write anything major, um, maybe 10, 15 minutes a day, just do it. Even if you don't get far, at least you'll be familiar with your project and you won't forget. Because if you write, if you binge write for like, you know, several hours and then put it away for a week, you come back, you have to reread everything again. But if you keep a little bit at a time, it's gonna be always on your mind. You're not gonna forget. So, and the main resource is your mentor. Um, they are supposed to be there for you. And sometimes you need to advocate for yourself to get that time, but they are the person that is probably your best resource. And Val, any final thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know, right? So we have the Grad Commons in Lead Library, and then we also now have Grad Commons in Gateway in our new building. And so what Dean Corrigan invested in was um, those, um, those things you turn upside down, hourglasses, and they have sand in them. And so you're supposed to use them during your dissertation, right? So you flip it and you just write, 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 write everything that you can get written down until you run out of sand, right? And then you can take your break and then you can come back and you can even come and do it. Um, we're actually reopening the Gateway Commons and the one in Lead Library on August 24th. So let us know if you want to stop on by. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists. I know all of our boot campers really appreciate your time. I personally do as well. It's super cool for me to hear and get like motivated as well. Um, a lot of advice was shared from time management, prioritize, don't overthink, set deadlines, meet regular with your advisor. But one thing I'm really taking away, and I hope you all do as well, boot campers, is to grant yourself grace, avoid comparisons, and um, know that life is still happening. So even if we just write 15 minutes a day, um, slow and steady wins the race. So thank you, everyone. And sometimes I'll add to that. That was a really great summary. Sometimes your best ideas will come at times when you don't expect. I came up with my dissertation topic when I was jogging. So. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Take care. Thank you.